Heavenly Father, we just uh, give you praise as we open your word this morning, as we open uh, this discussion on what you do in our world. Mm. Lord, give us open hearts and mind, truly open hearts and mind to receive what you have to say. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good. Good morning. Morning. Hey, this is Brian in pink shirt. He happens to have a PhD and teaches uh, chemistry at university of uh, here, right here in Davis. Uh, he's also involved in InterVarsity, and he teaches Bible class here, uh, the class called Sparks, uh, and he's one of the teachers, very well respected and loved. And he ha he's also, uh, he has a hobby. He gets master's degrees. Mm. <laughs> like he finished good a master's degree. Yeah, That's good hobby to have. I really admire it. Mm -hmm. So he got a master's degree in religion. Now he's finishing a master's degree in theology. Something he does, you know, when he's not, he's bored. <laughs> You're bored. There's a lot of classes out there to take. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. yeah. And this is Pastor Schmidt. Hopefully you've seen him around before. He's really bright today with his Hawaiian shirt, uh, and he's ready to be super passionate today. Yeah, hey, it's summer. Yeah, why not? Yeah. So this Sunday we conclude the sermon series on faith seeking understanding. Yeah. We have been grappling with issues such as uh, uh, our science and uh, religion compatible. Mm -hmm. Is Bible the Word of God? Is Jesus God? And this uh, morning, we are going to grapple with the issue of miracle. Mm. Do miracles really happen? Can we really believe in miracles? And this sermon, series, this particular sermon is heavily based on a particular book that we both read. Mm -hmm. It's called The Case for Miracles, and it's written by Lee Strobel. If you know anything about Lee Strobel, was, a, was an atheist, a journalist in Chicago. When his wife gave his life, uh, her life to Christ, uh, Lee Straubel says, you know what? She's changing. I just got to go on a journey and prove Christianity wrong. And he took this journey interviewing people, uh, researching evidences, and then at the end, he himself gave his life to Christ. He took a 60-person pay cut and became a pastor, mm -hmm. and now he writes. And he wrote this amazing book, very readable, Yeah, uh, got great stories, great arguments. So if you're looking for a book to read this summer, this is the book to read. It will increase your faith. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I want to share a passage with you. Uh, this is good, so I'm going to stand up for this one. This is Matthew 8. It. Yeah, it's a, stay seated, please. All right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it says, when evening came... Many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, Jesus, and Jesus drove out the spirits with a word and healed the sick. And we wonder when we read passages like this, is this only for the New Testament and Jesus, or do things like this happen today? Uh, when uh, several years ago, my wife uh, Peggy and I took some students on a mission trip to China, and uh, it was a six-week short-term mission. And... Uh, all was good, except we had that one student. And this one student, she was, uh, as soon as we arrived, was not having a good time. She had a difficult time transitioning with the culture. She had a very difficult time there, and she just didn't want to be there. She didn't want to go home, but she just didn't want to be there. Um, and so we kind of we talked to her and we went through orientation in Beijing and then we took an overnight train ride to our host city and uh, things just continued. She continued to be discontent and despondent and my wife Peggy has a counseling background. So she talked to her and other people were talking to her and my wife discerned that this is kind of beyond reason. This is getting beyond what counseling could help. Uh, why not pray? Huh? So we did, and uh, we prayed, we decided to pray, and ended up gathering the whole team of about 20 people, and uh, we were praying, and we thought, uh, let's read a passage. So we found a passage on God's love. We thought, uh, you know, Scripture is just based in truth, in God's Word. We wanted her to read it, 
And she said no. She couldn't read it, she said, uh, and she didn't believe it. So I was shocked with. And then at that point is when she started convulsing. Her whole upper body, uh, she started stuttering, and her voice changed at that point. You can imagine a group of 20 students freaking out who have never seen something like this before. And so we continued to pray. And each time we prayed for something that was theologically significant, the convulsions would increase. So it turns out that she had a lot of unforgiveness issues that we had to go through person by person. And this was taking so long, every once in a while we'd take a break and she would go back to her normal self. We would pray again and she would start convulsing. Well, we gained ground slowly over time, going through different scriptures and having her ask for forgiveness to a point where it stopped. But it was so late, I sent everybody back to their beds to go to bed. We saw her the next morning, uh, and she was just a completely different person. She was smiling for the first time in a long time. Her countenance was completely different. And I can tell you, everybody that we took on that trip counted that night as the most significant night that whole summer because they saw God work uh, miraculously just as we saw in the scripture that we had read. I mean, my interpretation was it was nothing uh, other than a miracle that could have made that sort of significant change. Yeah, and, you know, it's all across the world. You look Hmm. at... uh, Countries in Middle East, Africa, India, they're reporting miracles. Hmm. Uh, When I visited India uh, a few years ago, I visited a covenant church, uh, and I met the pastor, Paul Devakumar, and he was sharing the story that he took a team uh, to do evangelistic work in a village in Orissa. It's a state, and the state is very Hindu. There are a lot of radical Hindus in that state. And in this little village, the head of the village told Paul Devakumar that get out of my village, otherwise I will kill you. I will give you one night. Hmm. If you are not out of my village by this morning, you will be dead. Hmm. Uh, They decided, you know what, we are just going to trust God and stay and pray. And they prayed all night. When the morning came, Uh, They got the report that uh, the head of the village had a massive heart attack and died. (laughs) Coincidence or miracle? You hear about dreams and visions in the Middle East. Hmm. Mm -hmm. A Christian man in Saudi Arabia had this inner urge to go to to a marketplace. And when he went to the marketplace, this woman was yelling at him. Hey, you were in my dream. And he goes, what? He goes, yeah. And this woman with Borka, completely covered up, says, last night I dreamt, and Jesus was in my dream, and you were with Jesus, and Jesus told me that you're going to explain to me all things. What do you make of that? What do you make of that? Mm -hmm. And now it's, it's hard for many people, especially in the U.S., to believe this. And so we wanted to discuss that a little bit. And I've got some statistics because mm-hmm. everybody likes numbers. <laughs> um, and there was a national survey by Barna uh, across the U.S. And they asked, do you believe in miracles? And actually 67% of Americans said yes and 15% no. Uh, and that's higher percentage among evangelicals. And among the no, they tended to say no because either they think the supernatural doesn't exist uh, or that science has disproved the whole concept of miracles. It's kind of interesting in this survey, there's... Do uh, you want to oh, stand? Oh, gosh, yeah. yeah should yeah. I stand? Just, just it, it is numbers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we should stand for numbers. There was this one... Uh, occupation that was significantly higher than a lot of the other occupations of believing in miracles, and that was physicians or doctors. I think that makes sense because they get to see sometimes things that doesn't go uh, as how nature has planned it. Uh, Now, also, what's really interesting, 38% of people said they had experienced a personal miracle. And I'm sure there's people here today that you've actually experienced personal miracles in your life. 
Um, for when people are skeptical of miracles, which is understandable, I think it's a matter of worldview. We talked about worldview a few weeks ago. That's how we view the world. Like there's a Christian theistic worldview, believing in God. But there's also the naturalistic worldview, that nature is all there is. So that there is only nature and, and there's only matter. And that worldview believes in what we might call a closed universe or a closed system, that nothing can penetrate in. We just, what you see is what you get. But the Christian worldview believes in an open system so that God can reach into our universe and intervene in our world. I actually uh, brought a little example, uh, if you're okay really? with that. Yes, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> that have this ball, this hacky sack, it's green and white. Uh, and of course, you know the law of gravity. If I hold this up, you would expect if I drop it, it's totally gonna fall. Now, you would have expected to fall on the ground but I intervened. Yeah. <laughs> he intervened. This is a silly analogy. Did you have more to say about your intervention? No. You finish. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. You looked really excited. Yeah. This is an analogy of how God might intervene uh, in our world. So we expect the natural process to happen, but occasionally God would step in and intervene. And there's an interesting quote by St. Augustine of Hippo, one of the church fathers. It says this, miracles are not in contradiction to nature. They are only in contradiction to what we know of nature. And uh, when uh, the Big Bang Theory was proposed, it mm. irritated the heck out of a lot of scientists. Because for the longest time, people mm. thought the universe is all there is to it. No question of beginning, no question of beginner or God. But then this Big Bang Theory came along that there was a beginning. Now we have to start asking how did it all begin? Hmm. Who began? And you have the whole notion of that this universe might not be that close if it had a beginning. There might be something outside or someone outside who could easily hmm. meddle with the law of nature. Hmm. But that's just one reason why people usually... I uh, need this back. I get that back, right? People yeah. usually do not uh, believe in miracles because they have this naturalistic worldview. Yeah. But there are other reasons. Hmm. One of the reasons why people hesitate to believe in miracles or hmm. claim to believe in miracles is because they're embarrassed. Honestly, we have seen flashy TV preachers, hmm. uh, fake faith healers yeah. uh, who uh, pretend to do miracles and give Christianity and miracles in general a bad name. Hmm. So people are hesitant. People are embarrassed. They think they would be considered a weirdo if they hmm. say, yes, we believe in miracles. Hmm. But also stats show that uh, people who are rich and highly educated tend not to believe in miracles. Hmm. Or be they believe less than those who are not. And this is something hmm. that we need to grapple with. Because rest of the world, if you look at Africa, India, Middle East, uh, people out there don't have a problem believing in miracles. They are seeing miracles happen all the time. And let me hmm. say this very respectfully. This is no indictment of uh, the Davis culture. But we have this intellectual arrogance that since we have mm. PhDs, mm -hmm. that we have figured it all out. Mm. Mm -hmm. That we know it all. Mm -hmm. That the rest of the world must be foolish to believe in stuff like that. Well, you know what? If you really look at it, the Western worldview is a minority worldview compared to the rest of the world. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And you look at all mm -hmm. the other continents, Africa, Asia, Latin America, they do believe in miracles. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the educated and rich people, it is also with Christians. Mm -hmm. Sometimes Christians uh, do not believe in miracles either. In this book, The Case for Miracles, uh, Lee Straubel interviewed a theologian with a PhD. His name is Roger E. Olson. And he says this. He says, American religion, general, has become secularized. That is, a lot of churches don't really believe that God intervenes or guides. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's a, a position that many Christians take called secessionism. What that basically tells, says, is that uh, God stopped doing miracles. 
uh, deeds of power, or God does not give uh, gifts of speaking in tongues, and he stopped doing that after the apostles died, that we should not expect those things. And I think that has influenced how we do church in America. We, uh, we do church based on our own strength and on our wisdom. We say that in God we trust, but functionally, sometimes we act as if everything depends upon us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It shows how we do budget. It shows how we do outreach. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have a courtesy prayer, and then we talk and talk and talk, and on our own wisdom and strength, uh, try to do it all. Mm -hmm. When I went to India on a mission trip years ago, and the pastors were so excited, we were going through a village without lights. It was dark at night, and I heard a Royal Bengal tiger had come into the village. And I'm freaking out, and the pastor next to me is just singing and praising Jesus. And this pastor shared with me all the miracles that God did for his church. All the ways God rescued him and his wife and all the healing that he witnessed. So I come back to Indiana to my church, and I'm on my knees. I says, God, I want to see miracles. Why am I not seeing miracles in my ministry context in my church? And God whispered back and said, you have money. What God was saying, that most of your ministry, even though you, with your mouth you say, in God we trust, but your ministry is dependent upon human wisdom and strength. Until you learn to completely rely on me, God, you will not see the miracles that I'm doing in other places. See, sometimes... With our mouth we say we believe, but intellectually, deep inside, we doubt if God still does miracles. And we don't live our ministry life out of that boldness or conviction that Apostle Peter had. When Peter, in Acts chapter uh, 3, we read this. It's coming, wait. <laughs> Acts chapter 3, verse 6, when Peter met this beggar, who was asking for money, this is what he says to him. He looked at the lame beggar who asked for money and said this to him, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And he walked. Mm -hmm. And many parts of the world, God is still doing the same thing because they are praying, they are doing ministry with the same kind of boldness, and God is making lame people walk. Mm -hmm. Well, let's take a little time and define a miracle. Yeah. Uh, so not everything that we might call a miracle is necessarily a miracle, or there could be different levels of miracles per se. So you may drive into the Nugget parking lot and pray, and God mm -hmm. opens up a parking spot. We may not call that a miracle. It could uh, be a miracle. It could be. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty packed in there. <laughs> or, you know, finding a parking spot in downtown Davis uh, when the semester starts or the school yeah, starts. Right. That's yeah. a miracle. Amen to that. Yeah. <laughs> and really, miracles uh, are possible if you believe that God is the creator. I mean, uh, a miracle that he does today would be mere remedial work uh, compared to making the whole of creation. Uh, there's a definition we wanted to give you by Richard Pertell, and it says this. A miracle is an event brought about by the power of God that is a temporary exception to the ordinary course of nature for the purpose of showing that God has acted in history. So it is something that uh, is not really repeatable, but it's something that God does, and it shows his glory. For example, the parting of the Red Sea. Or Lazarus died and God, Jesus raised him back from the dead. Uh, they didn't go and test that miracle by axing Lazarus and saying, oh, I wonder if Jesus can do it again. It was something that happened. It showed the glory of Jesus. And then Lazarus went on to live until he died a natural death. Did you want to add anything to you that? You know, and God does miracles in our everyday life. Mm -hmm. And I'll just yeah. share a real quick one without going into details because of time. When I 
yeah. interviewed uh, for seminary education, was talking to the admissions director, great guy. Mm -hmm. He said, Shumit, do you want to go to seminary? I just want to caution you, you're in the Midwest. We don't have any Indian pastor. Back then there was not even a single Indian pastor. And it would be hard for you to get a job. Mm -hmm. Guess what? I never had a problem. Even before I completed my bachelor's degree, I served as pastors at different churches in small town rural churches. Hmm. Sometimes God does stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And most of our examples today are some of the bigger, yeah, yeah, yeah. bigger examples, just so you know. And I wanted to share one about physical healing. Uh, and sometimes the trouble with miracles, or especially with skeptics, is they wonder, oh, was this faked? Or, you know, is there any evidence or things mm -hmm. like that? And in the book that we recommended, there's actually a lot of examples. And Craig Keener, one of the people, a theologian that was uh, interviewed in the book we mentioned, has a huge volume work of just many examples and whole theology if you want a really tasty meal on miracles. Yep. Uh, I wanted to uh, share a story about Barbara uh, that that uh, Craig Keener had shared in the book. She was uh, diagnosed with MS, progressive MS, or multiple sclerosis, uh, while she was at the Mayo Clinic. And she had two doctors. One of them uh, was Dr. Harold uh, Adolph, and he had performed many operations and surgeries and things like that. And he labeled her as what he called hopelessly ill. Uh, kind of a sad label because before that, when she was in high school, she had a pretty healthy upbringing, such that she did gymnastics, uh, she was in orchestra and things like that. But then as her other doctor, Dr. Thomas Marshall said, soon things decided, decided, uh, started to deteriorate. So she would bump into things, started to trip, started to fall over and things like that and just started to go downhill. Uh, and so eventually uh, in the hospital, she was just diagnosed uh, through some various tests with progressive MS, and uh, just the prognosis was not good, according to Dr. Marshall. So over 16 years, her condition worsened. It just got worse and worse. She lost a function of one of her lungs. The other lung was working at half capacity. She needed a trach tube with oxygen. Uh, her bowels stopped working, so she needed a catheter. Uh, eventually, she couldn't walk anymore, so she was bedridden for about seven years. Uh, and uh, as the doctors described, she was, uh, it looked as if she was, as had a very swollen stomach and, and in a fetal position all the time. Uh, one of the doctors, Dr. Marshall, uh, basically talked with the family and said, this is a DNR or do not resuscitate situation. She's going to have to go to hospice. We can send her home, and she just has about six months to live. And that was in 1981. Uh, and what happened around that time is that on a local radio station, they shared her story. And about 450 Christians wrote in and said that they were going to pray for her. So her aunt and two of her girlfriends were really encouraged by this. So they went to her house uh, and wanted to read some of the letters. Well, while they were reading the letters, Barbara heard this voice behind her that said, my child, get up and walk. And she couldn't speak at that point, so they saw she was getting agitated. They took out her trach tube, plugged the hole, and she said, you're not going to believe this, but God just said that I should get up and walk. Go get my family right now. So they went to get her family. They didn't know what was going on. Her family rushed in, and she pulled out, off all her equipment and jumped up out of her bed. And you know what her mom did first? She jumped down onto the floor and grabbed her calves and said, Barbara, you have muscles. Can you imagine what that day was like for the family? The next day, she walked in to see her doctors in the hospital, and uh, Dr. Marshall uh, said this. He said, it was like I saw an apparition. I have never seen something like this before, he told Barbara. This is medically impossible, but you are free to go out and live your life. That afternoon, a chest x-ray was performed, and things were declared as perfectly normal. And Dr. Adolph said, I've never witnessed anything like this before and considered a rare privilege to observe the hand of God. 
Barbara has now lived 35 years with no recurrence of her illness, is married to a minister, and serving others with her life. I mean, it's just amazing. Amen. What would you, I mean, what do you say to that? Yeah. But this, <laughs> pro, this is the biblical God. He does the me- medical miracle. Yeah. The resurrection of Jesus, yeah. raising a dead man, bringing a dead man back to life. You know, skeptics over the years have questions, and I want to just give you really quickly a few Hmm. arguments for the resurrection of Jesus, because you cannot preach a sermon on miracle without talking about the resurrection of Jesus. This is the miracle of all miracles. Uh, One of the arguments for resurrection of Jesus, that the tomb was really empty, Uh, 75% of the scholars believe that the tomb was empty. One of the reasons why they believe that is called the Jerusalem factor. Now, if the resurrection happened in Davis, if if I was living in Davis and I claim that the resurrection of Jesus happened here and the body was still here, they could easily produce the body and say, hey, he didn't rise. In order to lie, I would have to go to Los Angeles or East Coast where nobody could produce the body. What the Mm -hmm. Jerusalem factor tells us is these disciples did not go up north to Galilee Mm -hmm. or far away somewhere where nobody could uh, contradict their claim. But right in Jerusalem where Jesus was crucified, dead, and buried, they claimed that Jesus Christ has risen. Mm -hmm. And nobody, no religious leader ever produced a body to disprove their claim. Mm. So this is what tells the scholars that the tomb was really empty. Mm -hmm. But other skeptics, other scholars who doubt resurrection came up with other reasons for not believing. For example, they would say uh, apparent death theory. What this theory tells us that Jesus really did not die. When the 19th century rolled around, Uh, Some scholars said, hey, Jesus really did not die. They call Mm -hmm. it the soon theory that Jesus fainted on the cross. Mm -hmm. That Jesus went into coma and in the coolness of the tomb, he was resuscitated. And honestly, with due respect to these scholars, these scholars don't understand crucifixion. If you look at crucifixion and scourging that Jesus had to go through, nobody ever survived. In fact, there was an article done uh, by uh, a group of uh, medical doctors in March 21st, uh, 1986, in the issue of the Journal of American Medical Association, a a team of three, including a pathologist from Mayo Clinic, did a research on scourging and crucifixion. And the description is so brutal that I don't want to go into the details. But scourging itself was enough to kill a person. Mm -hmm. Because the belt that they used, the thong, they would weave in metal balls and animal bones. So every time they would hit someone on the back, the back would tear open. It would tear open the back. The person would bleed to death. And on top of it, crucifixion just added a finishing touch to the whole process. In fact, it was so brutal that uh, a philosopher, uh, Cicero, said this. In second centu- first century BC, Roman philosopher Cicero calls uh, the whole crucifixion, it's coming? Maybe not. No. Calls crucifixion, the very word cross, should be far removed, not only from the person of the Roman citizen, Mm. but from his thoughts, his eyes, and his ears. It was so brutal. Jesus could not have survived. Jesus died, and that is the fact. Mm. The next argument that people come up with to counteract this whole claim that Jesus rose from the grave is Mm. the fraud or the wrong tomb theory. Mm -hmm. What the fraud theory tells us is that Jesus' body was stolen by the disciples, and then they lied that he has risen. Mm -hmm. Here's the problem. These disciples suffered a lot because of their testimony to the resurrection. 
They died. Many of them, like Peter, was crucified upside down because he believed that Jesus rose from the grave and that he needed to follow Jesus. If you look at the whole biblical story, these disciples were not brave people. Actually, when Jesus was crucified, they ran away. They hid out of fear. So what happened on the Easter morning that their characters changed? They became bold that in Jerusalem, they were claiming that Jesus Christ is the Lord. He's God. He has risen from the grave. The fact is, resurrection happened. They saw through the resurrection a God who is for them. They had no fear of death anymore because this God raises people from dead. And they were bold to proclaim Jesus has risen from the grave. Now, as I was explaining this to a particular individual in Indiana, and he said to me, then what about the terrorists? They also die for their beliefs. Doesn't that make their belief uh, also true? Not so. See, here's the difference between the disciples of Jesus and terrorists who die for beliefs. These terrorists were taught something that they are willing to die for. These disciples were not taught. They themselves were teaching others. They were the witness to the resurrection. Now, I could likely die for a lie, which someone taught me, but I cannot die for a lie that I myself manufactured and know to be not true. That's the difference. The disciples of Jesus, if they had stolen the body, they would not have gone on to mm -hmm. suffer and die for it. Mm -hmm. Secondly, Apostle Paul was a persecutor of the church. He was not one of the early disciples. A missing body would not have convinced Apostle Paul that Jesus has risen from the grave. He would have said, oh, they stole the body. The only thing that could convince Apostle Paul is the real resurrection and that exactly what happened. So this theory, this fraud or wrong tomb theory really doesn't work. And by the way, if they did go to the wrong tomb, there was this religious leader named Joseph of Arimathea, who was in charge of burying Jesus, who buried Jesus, would have just come out and said, hey, you guys went to the wrong tomb. This is the tomb. Here's the body. Your idea of resurrection is not true. But that didn't happen. Then the scholars come, the skeptics come up with this idea of hallucination theory. What they say is the disciples hallucinated. Their argument is that people go through grief mm -hmm. hallucination when people lose a loved one. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened with the disciples, that they hallucinated. Mm -hmm. One psychologist, his name is uh, Gary Collins. Mm -hmm. He wrote many books. This is what he says, that it is possible for an individual to hallucinate, but you cannot have a group uh, hallucination. Just like... You can have your own dream, but a group of people cannot have the same dream. Like my wife and I cannot at night dream together we are in Hawaii. <laughs> that would make for a wonderful, cheap vacation if we could hold hands and dream the same dream. It doesn't happen. Uh -huh. And the Bible tells us Jesus appeared to many disciples at the same time. Not just one by one, but to a group. They cannot all be in the same mindset to hallucinate. And lastly, Apostle Paul was not grieving. He was persecuting the church. He was not in the mind frame to hallucinate anything. It was the real resurrection of Jesus that convinced Apostle Paul that God raised him. And this fits the character of God. He's the God who raises people from dead. He's the God mm. who is still alive mm. and raised Barb from his bed, from sickness mm -hmm. to life. Mm -hmm. Because he's a miracle-making God. Mm -hmm. We should spend a little time on why miracles may and may not happen. Yeah. Um, you know, some of us may have heard reports of how miracles would happen in other parts of the world where the church is advancing, parts yeah. of Asia, Africa, Latin America. 
And I think it's related to what you were saying earlier, that when people uh, in the Western church feel like they don't have need, then they don't need God to work necessarily. In, in Africa, right? India, Asia, one of the common uh, theme is these places where miracles are happening, mm -hmm. sometimes they don't have decent hospital, medical facility. Unless God shows up, the person won't get healed. Sometimes they're living in darkness. They will not convert to Christianity or give their life to Christ unless they see a miracle. And sometimes miracle becomes an evangelistic tool that mm -hmm. God uses to bring people to Christ. Mm -hmm. But here's something that we want to end with. And this is crucial. I know some of you sitting here wondering, it's good that God does miracles and that he healed Barb. But what about my miracle? Mm -hmm. How come my prayer didn't get answered? Mm -hmm. How come I am still struggling with uh, sickness, mm -hmm. going through chemotherapy? How come my loved one died and I prayed and God did not answer my prayer with a miracle? Mm -hmm. Let me tell you first of all, it is not because you lack faith. Some mm -hmm. Christians have done real damage to other Christians by saying it is because you don't have enough faith that you didn't get healed. Baloney. Let me give you two examples. One comes from 2 Corinthians, Paul, 12, 7, 12, chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. Paul writes, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me three times. I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Mm -hmm. Paul prayed and to, for healing, but his prayer was not met with a miracle. God said, I'll give you grace to su sustain you, but your pain is still going to be there. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in the Garden of Gethsemane, prayed three times, God, don't let me suffer. But God didn't answer his prayer with a miracle. He went on, to, went on to suffer and die for the sins of the world. So if you are suffering and prayed and your prayer was not met with, with a miracle, you're in good company. You're not alone. So it makes you wonder why God allows so much suffering when he can easily do many miracles. Here's why. This is what I think. I don't have all the answers. But this is what I think why God allows suffering to a certain extent. Paul, in Romans chapter 8, writes this. Mm -hmm. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. What Paul is basically saying, that in all things, by the way, chapter 8 of Romans is all about suffering. In mm. all things that we suffer, God is working for the good of those who love him. And what is that good? It is not, not worldly good. The good that Paul defines here is that we become more like Jesus. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed, to become more like Jesus, conformed to the image of his son. And guess what? There's no becoming like Jesus without going through suffering. In Hebrews chapter 8, the writer says, Son, Jesus, through, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. He had to go through suffering and trust God through suffering mm -hmm. in order to show his obedience to God. So suffering can be character forming. We cannot become like Jesus, conform to his image without going through suffering and showing God that we trust him, no matter what. Not only through good times, but also through bad. And maybe, just maybe, that is why God allows suffering. Because as Apostle Paul said, if we suffer with Jesus, we'll be glorified with him. I would want to encourage us to not be embarrassed by the supernatural, but to press into it in the little things and in the big things to rely completely on God and put our need in Christ and pray and ask for things.
Amen. Let me end with a quote from G.K. Chesterton. He writes, the most incredible thing about miracles is that they happen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for what you did on the cross for us. Lord, we want to ask boldly and also suffer well. May you work in our lives this week so that we may spread your word and your gospel throughout. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.